So uh, I uh, suspect that we have the instruction not to try to delay uh, at the end of, uh, of our meeting. So I take it that we try to terminate this uh, exchange of views around uh, 7.30, something like that, if uh, it is agreeable. We will see how it works. But, uh, and I am also extremely happy that uh, you have accepted to be the rapporteur. <laughs> so, so we all count on you because uh, the experience demonstrates that uh, our exchange of views uh, are always uh, extremely diverse and uh, they are covering a lot of terrain and, and uh, it's very multidimensional. So for those who have already participated in this, uh, in this seminar, I should not introduce the speakers, but they are those who had not participated in such a seminar. And uh, I thank uh, very, very much all the, those who have accepted to speak and have accepted also our rule of the game, which would be to speak uh, in concentrating the messages in five minutes in order to multiply the exchange of views, the questions, and the dialogue, and uh, why not the quarrels from time to time. Uh, let me uh, just say a word on uh, precisely those who will intervene? Mazoud Ahmed, in my left, is president of the Center for Global Development, and uh, he has been extremely influential in the Bretton Woods Institution, IMF, and World Bank, and IMF. Uh, I would say that uh, I see Mazoud as you do in all intellectual and economic colloquium, and. Uh, Thank you so much, Mazout, for having accepted to be, to be here. Bertrand, in my right, will, will be the second speaker, uh, associate gérant and founder and, uh, and uh, uh, I would say leader of Blue Like and Orange Sustainable Capital. He was very instrumental as uh, general director and financial director of the World Bank Group. Then we have uh, Akinari Huri, we know him also extremely well, special advisor and member of the board of the Canon Institute for Global Studies, also member, I mentioned that en passant, of the Trilateral Commission. Yes. Thank you very much, Thank you. Akinori, for uh, being uh, with us. Pierre Jacquet is a professor of economy at the uh, National School of uh, Bridges, uh, <laughs> Shall I say that? Ponts et chaussées? Uh, <laughs> oui, oui, oui. Very famous ponts et chaussées. <laughs> Is, uh, and he was also president during 10 years of the Global Development Network. So uh, thank you very much, Pierre, for being with us. André Lévy-Lang, again, I'm mentioning the speakers in the order of the speeches. Uh, André, you are uh, founder and uh, uh, very instrumental, I have to say, of the Institut Louis Bachelier. Without you, there would be no uh, Institut Louis Bachelier. And uh, uh, Bachelier, you, you know, of course, is a, a very powerful uh, French mathematician who had the first idea of introducing math in the stock exchanges, and, uh, and uh, he uh, was uh, rediscovered late in the previous century, but appeared to be the real, real, I would say, uh, uh, intellectual that uh, more or less uh, paved the way for all the financial mathematics. Uh, <coughs> and you were uh, CEO of uh, Paribas Bank, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, every, everybody knows. Uh, John Lipsky is uh, also uh, present everywhere in the world, I have to say. From time to time, I'm thinking uh, he has le don d'ubiquité, as we say in French, uh, the capacity to be in all places at the same moment. So when you don't see him in Shanghai, it is because he's in Beijing. And when you trust that you see him here, he's also uh, together. I don't know where, uh, John, uh, Washington. Uh, I mean, you're, you're amazing. So thank you very much for having accepted. I mentioned en passant, 
that you were first deputy uh, MD of the IMF and acting MD of the IMF. And Jean-Claude Meyer, uh, vice chairman, International Rothschild and Company, but also previous uh, MD of uh, Lazare. Uh, no, it's not exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, and, uh, and uh, you are blessing us with uh, your remarks on the financial markets uh, uh, often, obviously, here. So I don't want to take uh, too much of, <laughs> it would be very bad for me to take too much of your time because uh, you uh, have to stick to the five minutes. Uh, I would only say that uh, as regards uh, what you have to say, you are the masters. And uh, I count on you to ship, to, to, to mention, and float three, four messages that would be very strong and would permit to start, really, the discussion. I was listing myself what we could say, and I saw 12 issues that are of great interest. And I, I don't want to list them, because I don't want to uh, <coughs> take, again, too much of our time. But uh, I see. Uh, of course, in the economy in general, a lot of things to be said. On uh, risks, global financial risks, I see uh, that we are in an inflection point, it seems to me, in many, many respects. And uh, not only inflation, not only, uh, uh, I would say, climate change, uh, but that it is really, frankly uh, speaking, very, very uh, dramatic as far as the change is concerned. I see some positives. I, noted five, four or five positives. Maybe we could uh, introduce the positive because I suspect that uh, the negatives would probably dominate. Uh, and I could uh, list seven negatives. Uh, and I take it that uh, they have to be taken very, very seriously because uh, experience has demonstrated that we should be uh, as resilient as possible and ready and stand ready for any kind of uh, unexpected uh, new events. Uh, and uh, we have, during the last period of time, a lot of events that were absolutely dramatic and were totally unexpected. Generally, they came at a moment when everybody is very quiet and calm, and we, we say we have solved all problems, and uh, now uh, it is the very calm and quiet waters. Nobody says that today, which is a little bit reassuring, so we are all supposed to prepare for uh, these unexpected uh, events that can come at any time. I, I don't think personally that the, the system, the global financial system, is really stable at the present moment. And not only because we have, of course, at the horizon, all the uh, so-called geostrategic risks that we are mentioning in the conference, and of course have a fantastic impact on global finance. All that being said, I will, without further ado, give the floor to Mazou. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jean-Claude. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, well, this is a very broad topic. So let me focus uh, on the issue of financing for emerging markets and developing countries. And let me offer you two propositions uh, with which I'm not sure everybody would agree, but I want to offer them in that spirit. The first is that, uh, as you know, We've just, after Marrakesh and the uh, whole of last year's efforts, there's a broad consensus that you need to scale up financing for emerging markets and developing countries, in part to continue to meet their own ongoing development needs, but also to enable them to deal with climate change, both in terms of adaptation and uh, in terms of their contribution to mitigating the level of emissions going forward. And there are various numbers that float around. They may be three times larger by the end of this decade. Uh, and they're also being asked to mobilize much more private financing to go with that uh, as part of their mandate. So let me say uh, two specific things in that regard. First thing I would say is that the conversation about financing the climate-related part of emerging markets needs 
is quite confused because we think of climate as being both mitigation and adaptation, but in my mind, there are very different strategies needed for that. Adaptation is just building into good development of schools, of roads, of, of hospitals, the extra cost of making them resilient to climate. That applies to everybody, rich and poor, low-income countries, middle-income countries, and this should just become part of the mainstream of good development strategies. On the other hand, mitigation, which is the contribution that will come from the policies developing countries adopt that will have a global impact, is really only about a dozen countries, a dozen emerging markets. What the vast majority of countries in Africa do will have no impact of any measurable quantity on global emissions. And therefore, the only sensible way to allocate the financing for mitigation is to target the dozen or so countries whose actions will have an appreciable impact on global emissions. But the MDB system is very, uh, it's very difficult for them to be able to do this kind of targeting. And the real risk is that we will end up spreading mitigation financing all over the world with very limited impact on global emissions and therefore waste some of that money. So what my first proposition is that we should think very separately about how to support adaptation, which should be across the board. And for mitigation, we need to adopt an approach which maximizes the emissions impact globally rather than thinking of this as a sort of add-on for every country. Uh, the second point I want to make is that there is an expectation that now the, the multilateral development banks, the regional development banks, will be successful in mobilizing much more private financing than they have ever done in the past. They have singularly failed to be able to do this. They set targets but almost never are able to meet them. And now they are being asked to, to do so with new instruments and, and a new willingness to do that. And the reason they are being asked to do that is because even if you multiply multilateral development banks' own lending by three or by four, it's just not enough. You have to bring in private capital because that's where the financing is. And people use numbers that become so large that they're not very meaningful. Uh, you can easily talk about hundreds of trillions of dollars that are sitting there waiting to be mobilized. But if you look at what's actually being mobilized, it's in a few tens uh, or, or low hundreds of billions uh, over some time. Now, uh, my uh, contention is that you can keep adding instruments and you can keep adding new initiatives. But the real problem, why the multilateral development banks are not able to mobilize private financing, is because they have a culture of risk aversion. So they're really not able to take on any of the risk that comes from doing things differently rather than just taking loans and putting them on their own books. And if you talk to anybody who is a private sector investor, actually there's some here <laughs> who talk to the multilateral development banks, they will tell you horror stories of the, how the culture of risk aversion makes it impossible to mobilize additional financing. And this culture of risk aversion comes partly from within but it also comes from the instructions that they receive from their shareholders who at the ministerial level make proclamations about how the, they should be more risk uh, tolerant, they need to go out and do these things. But by the time they, those instructions filter down through the bureaucracy in each of those national systems, to the directors who represent the same shareholders sitting on the boards of these institutions, it becomes quite diluted and then translated into don't take risks. And with that, we can spend many years uh, trying to 
come up with numbers and plans. But unless we tackle the risk aversion issue, in my view, we are not going to get very far in mobilizing uh, private finance. So I would say that's the, the second point I want to make. Let me just end by making a small side point, which is the risk aversion problem affects the multilateral development banks, but it also affects almost every public sector institution. And that's the nature of public sector institutions is that they are penalized for making mistakes, but they're not rewarded for making returns. You know. And in some ways, if you look at the IMF, and, and John and I were both at the IMF for, for many years, uh, if you look at the IMF, we are saying to the IMF that it needs to play a much stronger role as part of a global safety net, financial safety net, in a world where there are going to be many more shocks. But again, the design of those safety nets by the IMF runs the risk of being designed in a way that is so conservative that almost none of the <coughs> potential beneficiaries of the safety net will be able to use it. And so like many of the, uh, the, the problems that you would see is that the same approach to dealing with this obsession with risk aversion has to go across the street and into other financial institutions as well. So let me stop. With that, Joker. thank you, thank you, Masoud. You you were uh, clear, crystal clear, and uh, extremely concise, but uh, with uh, <laughs> real issues. And I'm sure that we will have a first echo of some of the real issues you mentioned with Bertrand, who has been in the World Bank and is in the private sector. Yes, so with some people around the table, I could also share some horror stories as uh, Masoud uh, tried to incentivize me to go, uh, but I will try to resist that temptation. Uh, let, me, let me start with uh, celebrating a good memory. 200 years ago, in 2015, uh, the entire world agreed on a new roadmap for our economy. We called it Sustainable Development. We added the Paris Accord in December, and previously to that, we had the Partnership for Development signed in Addis. So in 2015, we agreed that our economy should be more resilient, more inclusive, and more sustainable. And everybody agreed. Everybody signed. All our governments are part of this uh, roadmap. Uh, I remember at that time, one of the questions I raised was, it's great to agree on objectives. How do we pay for this? How much does it cost, and who is going to foot the bill? Uh, and, and one of my contribution was uh, the report from billions to trillions. Uh, here we are eight years later, we are uh, both totally off track and at a turning point. The number of billions available is, let, let me be optimistic, still the same. And the number of trillions needed has grown precisely because we are off track. On top of that, I mean, we've discussed that uh, yesterday and, and, and this morning, uh, we are facing uh, centrifugal forces wherever we look. Uh, you call it poly crisis, perma crisis. You have the geopolitical issues, economic tensions, the financial change of paradigm, the raise of interest rates, inflation, social, AI, etc., which basically move a number of people to look inward and not outward. And I think it is a, a very important issue. People are less and less interested by the rest of the world. And, and to a certain extent, I have sympathy for that approach. Uh, and so you see the results in a number of uh, big gatherings, be it the G20, be it the BRICS, be it the, the, the discussion around the loss and damage. So last year we celebrated as a success the creation of a loss and damage fund. And uh, la last week or two weeks ago, people say, well, it's going to be difficult and to, we don't want the World Bank to be in charge because the World Bank is American. <laughs> so that's, that's a reality. I mean, we are facing a, a global gap. So people now are playing the global south against the global north or the global west. And uh, the, tensions, uh, the tensions abound. I, I was sharing with Jean-Michel over lunch a, a, quote, a quote from Marguerite Ursula. Some of you might know her. She was a Belgian writer, actually. She lived and died in the US. And she wrote a book called The Memoirs of Adrian. So she put herself in the shoes of, uh, of the Emperor Adrian, uh, aging in his villa north of Rome and reflecting on Rome and the fall of Rome. And he say, uh, I know that the fall of Rome will arrive. How can I delay that moment? where the barbarians outside and the slaves inside will rush onto a world which we ask them uh, to uh, respect from far or to serve from below. And then he adds, but I would like them to love Rome. And I think, I mean, it does some echo with the situation we are facing today. Uh, and so we are, we are facing this tension. 
Uh, and it has, uh, it, it has I mean, impact on what uh, Masoud described. So we are facing challenges. The roadmap we agreed in 2015 requires trillions. I mean, it looks a little bit surreal to add trillions to trillions. And we have to find these trillions in a world where market conditions have changed. And I think a number of the speakers will discuss these market conditions. They are not helpful. Where the policy mix is changing as well. Uh, fiscal stress, the role of monetary policy has changed. Uh, and, and when the governance, the, the global governance is more and more fragmented. So in a nutshell, private flows are diminishing. They are minuscule and they are diminishing. Mm -hmm. It's less than 4% of European AUM which goes to emerging market, less than 2% of American AUM. So it's very small, it's diminishing for a number of very rational reasons, interest rates. When you're a small mutual insurance company, why would you want to take a risk in RDC or in Morocco if you can get 5% on US Treasury? It's very straightforward. Second, industrial policy. The Green Deal and IRAs are required to mobilize local savings. So here again, I think the French government example, put money in the French tech, put money in this, put money in this. There's no money left for the rest of the world. Everybody is doing the same. And on top of that, as I said, the inward looking perspective of a number of clients, I mean, I've heard pension funds and people telling me, my clients don't want their money to be used elsewhere. We have enough problem at home. Why would you move my money to help these people? Whereas in my country, we have also suburban issues, we have also transition issues, etc. So private money is under stress. And on top of that, of course, Basel II. Solvency, Basel II and Solvency II and the rest don't help or provide good excuse not to do anything. Public flows are under stress. In real terms, the flows to Africa have diminished. And there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, fiscal stress, but also Ukraine, refugees and, and the likes. So money is not going there. Uh, and you have the tension that, that Masoud uh, highlighted. Uh, on the one end, development. On the other, climate. Uh, with the same pot of money. So you're adding a number of priorities with the same pot of money. So all this was solved in Paris with the, 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 the summit on the Global Financing Pact. If you remember, there was a joint op-ed by Biden, Macron, Sunak, Ramaphosa, 13 or 15 heads of state, which basically says it all, a green transition that leaves no one behind. Hallelujah. So that's exactly uh, what we should aim at. But the reality is far beyond the headline. How do we get there? And on top of that, we are adding to the equation uh, norms and standards. I mean, let me call it ESG. I'm a, I'm a fan of this, but the reality is that we're imposing this on the rest of the world. I wouldn't want Europe to become Boboland, you know, that to impose on the rest of the world a number of very nice expectations which don't fit the capacity of a number of countries. So let me conclude with that. I think we really have to, to, to really shift uh, the needle. We have to, first of all, recognize the issue, and that was the benefit of the Paris summit. It put the, the, the issue on the table. There is a divide between the South and the North. There are real reasons for this divide. There are financing problems. We have a lack of money, and we have a multiplication of objectives, and we have very few places where we can do this properly, including, as Masoud said, within the MDB international system, which is less and less fit for purpose, very unfortunately. Uh, so it's very difficult to, to follow. And, say, and that's because the, the issue will be handled if we are able to, to join forces. And of course, it's easier said than done. Join forces meaning that the countries, the receiving countries, should do something, that the MDB and DFI should also change the way they handle things, that we address a number of the normative issues, which of course, in, in, a, in a universe where risk is the name of the game, people are less tempted to do. So good luck to the people who want to change Basel II or Solvency II in today's world. Uh, and we have to mobilize investors. So it seems that it's quite difficult. And, and the big issue, and I conclude with that, Masoud said, uh, well, I said, and we said that we need to increase the money in the system. That was a billions to trillions equation. I think it's still valid. We need to put more money. But maybe more importantly, we need to add a new chapter, which will be from trillions to millions. Even if hypothetically we got the trillions, I don't think we would be able to, 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 to use this money. And no, I'm very serious about this. And you see that uh, with the EU, uh, with the EU plan. Yeah. I mean, we are supposed to, to have 800 billion. I mean, the big chunk of this million cannot be spent. So that's, that's the issue today. <laughs> I, I think we are facing a, a fantastic, uh, I mean, dramatic and fantastic situation. And we really have to revise our operating system fast. If not, we'll gather next year and it's going to be even more problematic. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bertrand. Uh, I don't want uh, you to react. Uh, uh, I was looking for uh, your criticism of the promises that were 
simple promises uh, with figures, and we are not at all respected, the 100 billion. But for instance, yes. For instance. Huh, that, there are many other promises. It is a catastrophe. That's one of the many promises. Everywhere I go, they don't speak of trillions. They say, no, you said you would ship 100 billion, and we, we saw nothing. Anyway, uh, Akinori, it's your turn. Thank you. Um, two previous speakers uh, discussed uh, development finance, but uh, I think I'm going to speak about the world economy, main thrust of your uh, paper. Uh, let me begin with the U.S. economy. I hope you remember that I was optimistic about the uh, prospect for U.S. economic slowdown a year ago. Yeah, yeah. I continue to be optimistic, and the U.S. economy is now at a full employment. On top of this, uh, the fiscal pol policy stimulus that has been incorporated um, in the Inflation Reduction Act, strange name, but, uh, and CHIPS Act is materializing in terms of uh, expansion and business investment in the U.S. Uh, the stimulative tax effect will continue in 2024 and beyond. 2024 is, of course, a presidential election year under the split Congress. So there will be no new fiscal initiatives. But uh, there continues to be stimulative effects of the past legislation. In light of both the flow employment at present and fiscal stimulus in the pipeline, I think the Federal Reserve will be cautious about monetary easing. Um, they may begin to lower the federal fund rate target in 2024, of course, but perhaps only to the extent consistent with uh, increases in the unemployment rate. Uh, in other words, no preemptive easing, uh, but uh, cautious easing or uh, measured pace easing is likely. As long as fiscal policy is expansionary and monetary policy cautious, uh, that means high IS curve, investment savings curve, and high liquidity curve, LM curve, uh, in terms of Mandel Fleming's framework, uh, economic growth will continue with relatively high real interest rates and a strong U.S. dollar on exchange markets. <coughs> Stock prices will fluctuate perhaps within a range where monetary tightness, relative tightness, put, uh, puts a lid on price earning ratio and economic growth supports return on equity. Okay. Let me segue to the Chinese economy. Uh, we all know that the Chinese economy is under a few structural adjustment pressures. Uh, for example, a burst of property bubbles and debt overhang, communist policy of tightening grips with business, uh, actually more widely over civil society in general, which is stifling, uh, stifling entrepreneurship in China, and lastly, an unfavorable demography. Uh, at the same time, China's economic slowdown has been accentuated by the so-called silicon cycle, which goes up with IT-related production in the global, global market for two years and goes down for two years on average. 2023 was a dis, you know, declining period, and now the cycle seems to be hitting the bottom. Uh, we heard the same story in previous uh, sessions uh, by... Uh, semiconductor experts, actually. Uh, just like Japan experienced cyclical ups and downs uh, during the first decade after the burst of property and stock bubbles, the Chinese economy will also show cyclical ups and downs even when structural adjustment pressures put a damper on its trend growth. Uh, in 2024, the silicon cycle will turn favorable for China's economic growth from a cyclical viewpoint. It is also the case for Korea and other Asian uh, economies, as well as Germany, all of which, uh, you know, manufacturing is a key industry, therefore uh, sensitive to the silicon cycle. Uh, with respect to finance, I have a lot to say, but. Uh, Perhaps I would uh, come back if you're interested in uh, for uh, the following session. And also many people are interested in the similarity 
and differences between uh, Chinese burst of the bubble now and the burst of the bubble in Japan in the uh, 1990s. But um, I defer the discussion also at a later stage. Open up for a lot of questions to you, <laughs> if I understand. If thank, you are interested. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, can I add to what, all what you say, which is absolutely true, that the, the US prosper, apparent prosperity is really based also on a big current account deficit. And the difference between Europe and the US is based partially, it seems to me, on uh, the overall, you said that, of course, policy mix, which is uh, much more expensive in the US than in Europe, also including the fact that the depressive effect of the war in Ukraine is hitting the European uh, significantly. But the European, under the circumstances, are more or less, I'm speaking under the control of the IMF persons, but more or less balanced or with a slight surplus when the US is still permanently, uh, if I may, in, in deficit. But <clears throat> there is also, uh, for questions, possible questions, the demographic issue in the long run of China, uh, which looks a little bit like uh, the Japanese, but much worse. When I look at the figure, I think it's absolutely terrifying because you did not have a period where there was a one child per <laughs> household in, in Japan. No, uh, but but, but the, the price to be paid for this policy in China looks uh, very, very big. But thank you very much for your concise uh, um, um, speech, if I may, and uh, for reserving the case for uh, responding to questions. I take the next speaker who is in the order of our uh, Pierre Jacquet. So Pierre, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jean-Claude. Um, let me uh, focus on another pathology of the international financial system, which actually creates a bridge between what Bertrand and others say, that there is a lack of money going to developing countries right now, and the fact that uh, a few years ago there was a lot of money going to developing countries. And the bridge is called debt. And I think that uh, this, uh, this pathology of the international uh, system is the uh, risk of emergence of a new debt crisis with considerable impact, especially for countries in Africa, but not, not only. And the situation is a bit similar to the uh, 1980s. We had an influx of money uh, into these countries, and that corresponded to the recycling of excess liquidity in rich countries in search of higher potential returns. And then we had a number of shocks. And of course, the shocks are COVID, the slowdown, uh, the economic slowdown in developed countries, inflation, uh, rising uncertainty, the drying up of new funds, depreciation of currency, uh, currencies against the dollar, and so on. So as a result, the burden of the debt service, which is still lower than historical records, has significantly, significantly increased, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, again, not only, and in Latin America. Um, let me also mention the net transfers to IDA countries, that is the net financing inflows minus the debt service, have turned negative uh, in the face of needs to, and, and, and that happens in the face of rising needs to engage uh, into strategies of green growth strategies, to fund the energy transition, to reach the SDGs and, and, and so on. Right now about 30 countries or more are considered to be in a high risk of debt distress. Second point, there are three differences with the earlier debt problems. One is that the, much of this debt is now held by the private sector. Private sector and multilateral institutions, but the big new thing is the private sector, all of the private sector. And that has been a major tendency in the evolution of debt. And I'll come back later to the implications of that. The second, which is linked to it, this much of it, is a shift from loans to bonds. With uh, uh, an interesting fact, which is bonds do not carry the same risk of systemic event than loans. And therefore, when there is a problem, the incentives to act is even lower. And then we all know that the incentives to solve debt problems has always been quite weak. 
it's even weaker when you have bonds because bonds are a private thing, not, not, not a, a collective issue. So that, that's one of the difficulties. And the third difference is the considerable uh, rise in non-DAC creditors, especially China. In Sub-Saharan Africa, China now holds close to 60% of bilateral public and publicly guaranteed debt. And China has become the first bilateral creditor of developing countries. The implications are mounting obstacles to prompt an effective resolution of debt crisis. And we see that every day we take commitments, we have nice frameworks, but implementing those frameworks has become increasingly uh, difficult. Uh, so ineffective crisis uh, resolution. My third and final point is that we are again addressing this debt issue in a crisis resolution mode. As I, agree, as I said, as I argued, this crisis resolution mode is not effective. It's very slow. But again, we are doing what we did in the past. We have a crisis. We try to solve it. It takes too long, but in the end, we will do something. I think it is time to move to more crisis anticipation. It's not really prevention, but the idea that we should prepare for the next crisis. This is the nature of capitalist financial flows. There are excesses followed by excessive disillusion. It's always been the case, and we have not been able to integrate that in the approaches, strategies, and instruments. So I would suggest that there needs to be more thinking about how to make ex ante debt restructuring mechanism more automatic. Um, it is complex. Uh, it uh, requires to distinguish between proper and improper use of borrowed funds. It uh, requires to distinguish between liquidity crisis and solvency crisis. But I think the risk, the risk of debt distress in the face uh, of exo exogenous shocks need to be endogenized. There are, I think, many ways to do it. One is to go back to the proposal made by Anne Kruger a long time ago to create a debt restructuring, a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, the SDRM, which never floated very far, but I think it's a very important idea and suggestion. It could be uh, endogenized in debt contract. It could be also uh, endogenized through uh, contingent debt instruments. And I think that's one aspect of financial innovation that could be quite promising. So my point is that the time has come to spend energy on a more lasting debt management framework, which is today, today really lacking. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Pierre. You're absolutely right in mentioning the fact that uh, China is not members of the Paris Club, and that as far as governments are concerned, it's an enormous uh, hole in the system. And uh, I, I cannot uh, resist uh, to hope that uh, China will understand at a certain moment that it is time to join some kind of, uh, I would say, global mechanism. I'm a little bit more skeptical on Anne Kruger proposal, but we will discuss that. Uh, I don't open any discussion. I turn to the next speaker because I see that John is uh, ready to intervene. André has the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, in his introductory notes, uh, Jean-Claude mentioned about the neg embedded negative risks for the financial system. Number five was uh, cryptocurrencies. So I thought I might make a comment on I financial innovation in general and its impact on finance. We're starting with cryptocurrencies. Looking at the numbers, uh, they are not a systemic risk. Uh, the numbers look huge. Actually, it's about roughly 1,000 billion, so 1 trillion euros. That sounds like a huge number. Roughly one half is the Bitcoin, one half is the other cryptocurrencies. Ether and so on. But if you look at that number, it's only half the balance sheet of BNP Paribas. So, well, yes, I checked the number. So it's not a systemic risk, okay? So it is a different kind of risk, of course, because of fraud, uh, the mafia, and all this. And now we have, it's, it's, it's a speculator's money, basically. It's not money, by the way, because it's not a payment system. Uh, actually, it's not really as 
a secret as people think, because if you want to spend it, the only way to do it is to go to a broker and get dollars or euros, right? So then you get into the system. Anyway, but looking at the financial inno innovation, I think there's another one which is very important, which started re really in 2008 with the launching of the uh, s s smartphones, uh, which is payment systems. That's a major change because now uh, electronic payments represent uh, the major part of, of retail payments in every form, through credit cards, through your phones, uh, through, through the internet and so on. And clearly, it's been a, an open field for the GAFAMs uh, and, of course, for a number of startups in that area. The reason the GAFAMs entered that field is because, uh, first of all, the regulations for payment systems are not as strict as regulations for banks. As long as you're not a bank, you can operate. Second, uh, they get uh, huge amounts of data. And data, of course, is money for them because of the advertising which goes with it. But the moment they get into banking, then they get an avalanche of regulation <laughs> in many ways. So in a way, that's a barrier to entry uh, to banking, which protects the banking system. On the other hand, the innovations are used by the banking system. Going back to cryptocurrencies, as you know, they use the blockchain, and there's a number of cases of bank, private banks using blockchains for their own purpose. So that is positive and negative. To conclude on payment systems, I must say that uh, it is indeed a threat for retail banking, but all banks have joined the crowd in terms of offering that system. And also, as you know very well, Jean-Claude, it gives ideas to central banks. And the, the, the code is CBEM, Central Bank Electronic Money. So far, it hasn't been you know, put in motion. Of course, bankers are really saying, if you really do it all the way, what do we do as banks? OK, so it may happen, I think, from what I understand. But it may happen only to cover the problem of interbank or intercountry payments, international payments for small amounts, which are indeed an area in which progress is needed. So uh, to, it's a different subject from all the macroeconomics we're discussing. But it's a very important impact. Again, cryptocurrency is not a systemic risk. Uh, moral risk, maybe, uh, in, you know, criminal risk, but not systemic. And on the other hand, payment systems, a major revolution for retail banks. And not banks, insurance, fund management, uh, the whole financial industry. Thank you very much indeed, Andre. <coughs> you were uh, concise and, and luminous. I, I have to say that uh, as regards the uh, crypto, uh, the, the cryptocurrency that would be issued by central banks, uh, the BIS is working, la, la, like you know, very, very actively on that. I take it that they consider that a major constraint is not to destabilize the banking system, that's clear. So to try to have this electronic uh, uh, crypto uh, money uh, exactly as the equivalent of the notes, which of course calls for also for certain limitation, but it is the start will probably be in this uh, domain and uh, they, are, they are very close to, to start the thing. And, I mean, technically, uh, of course, uh, uh, it has been totally explored. Uh, the blockchain that you mentioned is uh, very well in order. And you have several concepts. Enfin, you know that better than, than anybody. But there are many, many uh, concepts that uh, can be utilized. You, you were a little bit uh, benign on the so-called uh, uh, speculative instruments, it seems to me that we really have a problem uh, of, uh, of uh, fraud, of, uh, uh, I would say, illegal behavior, uh, uh, criminal activity, uh, financing of terrorism, and so forth, which, which remains underlying. And I hope very much that the authorities will regain control, because there has been a period of benign neglect which uh, was uh, over-exaggerated. Anyway, OK, thank you very, very much indeed, André. I turn to John.
And Thank don't you. be surprised if we address many different problems. Yes. The yes. idea of this seminar, yes. traditionally, is that we address a lot of problems, and then we uh, discover, of course, that we miss two or three that are also important, but it should come from the audience. John, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, and our chairman instructed us to focus on narrowly rather than uh, across the board. Uh, <clears throat> I've been uh, thought I would talk a little bit about what's happening with trade. And uh, as, uh, as I said yesterday in the plenary session, uh, what's particularly notable is from 1950 to 2008, essentially, trade grew faster than the global economy. In other words, trade as was intended by the architects of the post-war in, uh, international system, that it would facilitate trade and trade would be uh, a, drive, a key driver of, global, of the global expansion. Since 2012, essentially since the fading of COVID, we now have had a decade in which eight out of 10 years, trade has grown more slowly than uh, the overall economy. And the expectation is that this could well continue uh, going forward. Now, there are some uh, obvious reasons why this might be happening. Uh, there's been post-COVID relatively slow growth in general, and if, uh, that has meant slower in private incomes, uh, slower growth in private income, and in a context of slower population growth in many countries. But it has given rise to discussion of deglobalization, fragmentation, et cetera. And uh, this has been accompanied, these uh, concerns have been accompanied by a dramatic deterioration in the operations of the World Trade Organization. In 2008, one of the key priorities of the, G, of the first G20 Leaders Summit was to prevent new trade restrictions and to promote the adoption of new liberalization, specifically the adoption of the WTO's Doha Development Round. Well, the opposite has happened. A lot of new protectionist measures have been adopted and the Doha ground has been completely abandoned. And in the meantime, as is well known, the WTO's dispute resolution mechanism has fallen into disuse and disrepair and um, symbolizing a deterioration in the trading system. But it's probably worth thinking a little more broadly about what is the underlying uh, aspects of this uh, change. Let's think about before, in the post-World War II orders, trade was driven by gains in cost and efficiency. Uh, essentially, it was obvious economic incentives that drove trade through the opening, the reduction in restrictions, lowering of tariffs, et cetera. But the focus was, a net, was essentially economic. And in fact, uh, a high point, I think, in the considering that many of us came from used to a world in which import substitution was considered a, a viable means of development. I can recall the Commission on Growth and Development uh, that was uh, operated by the World Bank, established by the World Bank and chaired by Mike Spence, the Nobel laureate, that concluded that there was no, no case of uh, sustained rapid development of emerging developing economies that did not involve an opening of economies to the world markets rather than the opposite. But it seems to me that what is happening is there has been a shift in uh, considerations, not to abandon, not that there's been an abandonment of the idea of we're pursuing economic efficiency, but there are new considerations that have been taken into, are being taken into account and taken seriously. And they, I think, can be lumped under the rubric security. Security about energy supply, security about food and health, security about even technology. And uh, as a friend of mine, Marsha Vandenberg, says, uh, this is really driven by three C's, she puts it. First C is conflict, uh, Ukraine, and U.S.-China tension. Second, COVID, that brought about a new realization about potential uh, issue of issues of resilience of supply chains and the 
danger of uh, relying on foreign uh, on foreign trade and uh, avoiding bottlenecks. Third C is climate and the uh, clear need for international cooperation, but also the possibility that uh, uh, climate oriented measures like a uh, border adjustments uh, for carbon tax could create new barriers to trade. And then finally, as we've talked about today, in tech and technology uh, and the source of proliferation of both new forms of subsidies as well as new forms of trade restrictions. Uh, and as we've heard this morning, subsidies in this area are becoming so ubiquitous that they're virtually meaningless. Since everybody's subsidies, subsidized, nobody has any particular national advantage. And then finally, uh, the new need, to, uh, the new uh, uh, allied aspect of trade in data and the concern about data uh, security and uh, the worry about cross-border data access. Now we can see part of this in a reallocation of trade. You might call it trade diversion, but certainly we're seeing the growth of manufactured uh, exports from Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, India, and in the United States, especially Mexico, as some recent research has shown that in many cases, these uh, the businesses that are expanding trade in these, let's call them more uh, frontier markets is probably the wrong word, but uh, newly expanding markets may actually represent investment of former uh, of firms that formerly uh, located those uh, uh, those activities in China. So where are we headed? Well, the G20, uh, the recent G20 leaders the summit had a new uh, 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 section on trade. And it said that, well, here's what it's looking for. Here's what the G20 are committed to. A system that is rules-based, rules non-discriminatory, fair, open, inclusive, equitable, sustainable, and transparent with the WTO at its core. What are the measures that they agreed to do this, to accomplish this? First, they said resurrect the, dis the uh, dispute settlement system by next year. Good luck with that. That they will promote Im exports from micro and small and medium enterprises. That they support the G20 generic framework for mapping global value chains that they will continue work on the high-level principles on the digitization of trade documents, and they will support the WTO's aid for trade. Doesn't sound like a very uh, active uh, agenda for turning around trade. Uh, my conclusion is that these three Cs, uh, conflict, COVID, climate, and T, technology, are going to have an impact and it's going to be a while and before we can start to resurrect a, fra a trading system that is consistent with the goals announced by the WTO, uh, excuse me, by the, by the G20. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you are <laughs> killing one of my, my very small list of positives because I, I, I would say despite the geostrategic tensions, uh, despite the quarrels and the wars, uh, we had a communique of the G20. The full body of the international community signed it. The triumph of the Indian uh, in you know, managing that to get that um, communique has been quite remarkable. And uh, also in our domain, the pure financial domain, the system of the Basel committees, the Financial Stability Board, reporting to the G20 continues to function. So, so we, we have there something which is perhaps uh, miraculous, but, but continues to go, and we will see. Uh, Your skepticism is perfectly justified. <laughs> I was focused just on trade. I <laughs> yeah, 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 no, 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 you're right. You're right, and on, on 
on trade, uh, we, we are very likely, of course, to be disappointed. That, that's absolutely clear. Thank you so much. I turn now to Jean-Claude, and he will have the mot de fin. Please, Jean-Claude. Thank you very much. Uh, last year, we were in the middle of a storm, and I anticipated, like Mr. Horry, a, during a very dark situation, which could lead to a more rosy picture in 2024. Today, I confirm a more rosy picture for next year, but just with a delay, i.e. end of next year, in spite of the huge geopolitical risks around us, particularly since October 7th. Last year, we were wondering when the rates would increase. Now a question is when a cut will happen. World inflation has dropped to its lowest since two years. Growth has declined without a major recession in spite of interest rates at their peak. The tightening cycle is coming to an end, but central banks have to finish the job and keep interest rates higher for longer. It does affect the stock market since mid-October. It will slow the world growth and will hit consumers. But at the end of next year, at the end of 2025, according to Jean-Claude, uh, we can forecast a soft landing in the US, less so in Europe, which faces a risk of stagflation. I'm sorry this year not to be very original. It seems to be an awful cliche, but sometimes cliche do happen. Today, after October 6th, 7th, the war in the Middle East will cause uh, a probable rising cost of energy, compulsory additional investments in defense, the reduction of world trade, a weakening confidence, and therefore a lot of uncertainty and volatility on the markets. This new situation has a chance to increase inflation and reduce growth, but hopefully should not encourage further tightening in order to avoid the risk to squeeze the economy too much. By the way, this bad news have not affected the stock markets too badly. Oddly enough, the markets being more sensitive to the recent rise of treasury yields, which favors bonds against shares, and then being more sensitive to the pose of the Fed rates. In spite of this huge risk, we can uh, keep our previous scenario of a soft landing in the US and a stagflation in Europe, even though I'm today a little less confident and more cautious. Three additional com comments. First, there is a large divergence between the US and the Eurozone. In so far as the GDP, it's will, it is flat in Europe and around maybe two to three percent in the US. Inflation in uh, the US is 3.7 percent in September, 4.3 percent in Europe. This divergence is because the US have started earlier their monetary policy and because Europe has much less resilience, being fragmented, uh, being near the war in Ukraine, with an aging society, with a financing coming from banks instead of equity markets in the US. Second point, this divergence should last until the end of 24. Inflation could be 2.6% in the US, 3.2 in the Eurozone, the growth 1.6 in the US, and very small in Europe, around less, around 1% due to uh, particularly sort of recession in Germany. In a nutshell, more inflation in Europe than in the US, more growth in the US than in Europe. Maybe besides the so soft landing in the US, we shall have a landing in, the U in Europe. Third point, central banks seem to be in favor of a pause from now on. 
and we should start cutting rates second half of next year, fueling then a recovery. To conclude, the stock markets should remain volatile and relatively flat until the third quarter of next year. The US stock markets and the Japanese one could go up slightly more than the European stock markets, which will remain bumpy. But naturally, all stock markets would go up again as soon of cuts <laughs> of interest rates will appear, i.e. end of next year. This scenario may be too optimistic. It will be achieved, provided that the slowdown in China and the accumulated, accumulated debt worldwide do not deteriorate further, and above all, that the crisis in the Middle East remains limited. Contrary to what's happening now, the geopolitical risk might greatly influence the markets and dramatically change this very quiet forecast. <laughs> You're prudent. <laughs> you reserve all possibilities, which I understand pretty well. Merci. Okay, Jean-Claude, thank you very, very much indeed. So we have a lot of uh, concepts uh, and... Uh, Thank you very much. I'm going to ask a very simple question. I'm a, I was a finance educated person, actually, but I want to break it down in a very simple uh, manner as a f former um, decision maker person. Uh, my question is, what do you mean by economic efficiency? The word came often time. But for me, economic e efficiency is to be able to be on the market and finance my projects. Um, what I understood is money is not going to flow from what I've understood. So my question is, do you think um, as a person who I intend, but I used to, um, you know, deliver for the people who elected me um, do I have more chance to going to China and raise money than coming to Europe to do so, um, considering the fact that um, I might be in, the co in a continent that, it w that is wealthy, that can sort of, you can borrow against um, the wealth that is there, providing that you manage it well and you fight corruption and what have you. Um, so how do you see the China-Europe um, uh, relationship or even balance in, to that regard, because that's the question that is posed to us in Africa. And what do you think or how do you see some alternative funding mechanism for infrastructure financing? Um, as I said, um, for countries who do have wealth. Um, so that, that's really my question as a as a client, <laughs> you know. That's a very good, how you look very good question indeed. And uh, perhaps Masoud could uh, start to respond. Uh. Well, I would just say uh, one uh, thing in response oh, now, sorry, sorry. which is that uh, I think at the moment, it's actually quite hard to get money out of China. If you look at the numbers, uh, for Chinese lending, particularly to Africa. They've gone down quite dramatically. I don't have the numbers in my head, but it's like a very dramatic decline in the financing from, uh, and the second thing I would say is that some of the emerging markets are still able to access it, but it depends on how robust their own finances are. So anybody who has relatively high debt or uh, has high repayments in the next year is having difficulty accessing the markets, but the others are able to do it. Maybe Jean-Claude will have more market information on this, but. Jean-Claude, you want to say a word? No. Uh, let me only mention myself that uh, it's not China vis-a-vis -vis Europe, uh, as far as I understand. It's China on the one hand, vis-a-vis -vis all other, I would say, continent, including the US, Europe, and uh, uh, there are two, two 
aspect uh, in what we have observed. One is that uh, China has a real problem and creates a real problem when they refuse to take into account that they over-indebted some uh, countries and uh, they don't participate in the system which permits to alleviate the debt. So it's a real issue and uh, they are uh, having some problems with the Silk Road, Belt and Road, uh, that, that are associated with this. And uh, <coughs> of course, you still have the African Development Bank, the World Bank, I mean, the, the system, the multilateral system still there. And of course, what Mazoud was saying in permitting this system to take more risk, capture more, have a, a leverage with the private uh, sector and have more money for Senegal and for the other African countries is something that we would uh, strongly uh, recommend. But, uh, yeah, please, La last word, and then yes, I, just I follow the question. Because we, we, with, with, some, with some people around the table, I, I, I have skin in the game. Uh, I'm trying to invest in, in this country, and, and uh, the, your question is absolutely legitimate. One of the issues we are facing, and again, we are, we are discussing with Jean-Michel, and I'm sure you will add something to this over lunch. Uh, as, as Masoud said, one of the big issues we are facing is that the, the public system is not up to the expectations, full stop. Uh, and that's, that's a massive issue. You mentioned risk aversion. I think this is the crux of the problem. Uh, again, I don't want to enter into a raw stories, but we, I've, I've been personally involved in three or four reports on blended finance. I'm tired of doing reports on blended finance. I mean, we know everything which is working. We know all the instruments that should be put at, at, at risk. We should just do it, and it's not happening. Again, there are many reasons for that. So I fully support your reason, I fully support the idea that we need to shake the tree and do. There are instruments, there are resources. I mean, we, we don't need to invent the wheel. I mean, that is not the, the, the problem. The problem is just to find a way to get there. So uh, the question for all of us is uh, who blocks? Uh, and, but, but we will respond afterwards because I have okay. five que questions. So, so since you declined the request of yeah. the prime minister, I'm going to go back by the, by the window and, and maybe ask the same question under a different angle. I'm going to start with a very obvious statement, but it's good to make it. If you have one euro or one dollar to invest, it's much better to invest it in uh, India to fight climate change than it is in uh, Denmark, right? That being said, and going back to what Masoud and Pierre said, you know, clearly there is a risk context, which is that yeah, there is a, a increasing uh, perception that debt is, is, is going to be risky. And, and so a suggestion maybe for regulators in the context of Basel III and SICA and the equivalent in Europe would be to sort of ring fence this kind of investment, separate from the uh, usual EM debt, and recognize the fact that it's such a benefit globally uh, that you could reduce the risk of that investment almost to zero uh, from a CCAR perspective, right? Uh, of course, under the proper monitoring, uh, so that that uh, return uh, is understood and the risk is seen as acceptable by the rest of the, of the world, right? Okay. We take uh, this question and you reflect on the response. I'm sorry, I yeah. go through the... The yeah, successive I, question now, Jean-Claude. You, you will the first to, to respond. Uh, I have a question following the one uh, Prime Minister raised regarding the investment in infrastructure. Actually, my question is for Masu. Masu, you mentioned uh, multi uh, development bank, MDB, are required to mobilize the private business, make investment infrastructure. But seems to me, by nature, the private business is more risk aversion relative to MDB. So in another way, private business is not, is not good identity to make investment infrastructure. So it seems to me it's kind of a contradiction. So I want to listen your comment on that. Thank you for this very good question. Please. Okay. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you. So, so one, one issue that, uh, uh, that worries me is that uh, the 
levels of debt around the world are high, higher than uh, uh, for the last 200 years. And the Economist is, is running a story uh, on this uh, right now, I think uh, very valid. And the big question behind that is uh, how do we think that uh, interest rates and growth rates will compare to each other over the next decades or so? And so we had this discussion R versus G, you know, uh, and, and the, you know, uh, until two years or so, people were, I think, converging on the view that uh, our star, the equilibrium interest rate, is declining, falling below the growth rates that we can sustain, and so the high debt levels are not an issue. But I think the three Cs that John mentions, all of them drive up interest rates, um, drive down growth rates. So uh, how do we deal with these enormous debt levels in the world where they are maybe higher than the cheese or for longer time periods. So that's, uh, and, and what, what do we do with that crisis, uh, you know, in emerging markets first maybe, and then later also in the more mature ones? Yeah, well, I would say the, the central bank are not doing what they did in the first oil shock and second oil shock, namely practicing benign neglect vis-a-vis -vis inflation, and then being obliged to catch up dramatically with interest rates at the level of 20% in at the beginning of the 80s and not at five or four, as is the case uh, in the US and Europe. So fortunately, part of the explanation that we do not have this dramatic crisis that we had with the Latin America crisis of, the, uh, of this period uh, is perhaps that uh, we have wiser central banks, but I stop there. Uh, Jean-Michel? Uh, Jean Oh, <coughs> sorry. It was me, you, you too have the floor. Uh, sorry. Please. Uh, as in the order that you would uh, you would prefer. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to answer Prime Minister uh, Touré and make a comment on trade. Uh, actually, it's the second year or the third year in a row, I think, that uh, negative in uh, Africa ex is experiencing negative net flows to China, which is an unprecedented event. Uh, since for the past 20 years, okay? And it's going to last. It's going to last because uh, China is very slow at restructuring its debt, and it's downsizing dramatically the Roads and Belts Initiative for internal domestic uh, fiscal reasons, and also the overall uh, debt situation and interest rate situation. So it's uh, highly unlikely that in the coming five years, uh, there will be um, as open access to Chinese money as it has been in the past, let's say, 20, 20 years. And of course, it's very unfortunate because this is taking place at a moment when, where, because of everything that has been said here about interest rates, etc., markets are shifting. Basically, it has come, we have come to a moment where this now, it's nearly impossible to raise equity for investments in uh, emerging markets, and especially for Africa. And debt flows have shifted back towards OECD countries, in a nutshell. Uh, so uh, we are back to a situation where public flows are really the key concern. And you can, as Masoud already mentioned it, uh, we have to, to really focus on debt restructuring, debt consolidation. And here, China is the leader. Nothing will be done without their leadership and their acceptance of terms, given what uh, Bertrand said uh, about their preeminence in uh, debt stocks. And second, of course, public institutions, bilateral or multilateral, are at the forefront of providing uh, additional uh, money uh, for liquidity concerns or for investments. Yet, and I will stop that, there on that because we could, we could spend a lot of time on this issue, there's still room open for specific invest, private investments in infrastructure. Because if you go on a case-by-case -case basis and if you're able to provide exciting investments with uh, high returns, uh, because of the overall liquidity situation, uh, you could attract, one could attract specific investors in specific PPPs, but that, which require a lot of, uh, which in, 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 uh, of uh, preparation and framework from governments to make those PPPs credible. 
But this window is still, in my mind, uh, open uh, on the private side. Thank you. A very no. and, and a very short comment on trade. Mm. Uh, I'm participating, I'm uh, involved in uh, several uh, very capital intensive multinationals. Uh, what is very striking uh, in, for those corporations and in their strategies is that uh, beyond everything that uh, Mr. Lipsky mentioned and which are completely, fully correct, uh, there is now a very different um, beacon in terms of choosing uh, locations of productions. This used to be mainly labor costs, which is, has driven uh, the manufacturing sector uh, and especially the heavy manufacturing sector in, in Asia. But now the cost of energy and access to a competitive clean energy uh, has become the new beacon because labor costs are not playing the same role as they were before for technological reasons. Robotization is lowering in relative terms the role of labor costs. And but, you know, having clean energy is really what matters for those heavy industries. So, and this is, by the way, one of the opportunities for emerging economies, including Africa. And uh, the, the thinking about heavy industry has completely changed uh, and uh, has opened new opportunities for countries which have this type of access and building a competitive advantage which was not absolutely not there 20 mm -hmm. or even 10 years ago. Just Very interesting. I'm, I'm sorry because we have this, the first batch of questions. So we stick to the five questions that we have, and we see how to respond. And then you will be the first to uh, ask the next question. But Jean-Claude is the first to address the part of the questions that uh, he wanted to comment on. So I just wanted to come back, come back to the question of the former prime minister of Senegal, in, in so far as Chinese financing. The problem is not the availability only, it's the quality. And when we look at the Chinese financing, we see, for instance, there has been a financing of a, of a highway in Montenegro. The cost of a road was absolutely outrageous. And of course, they offered to Montenegro a 30 years financing. But that's terrible for Montenegro. They don't know how to sort out this story, not to mention copper mines uh, in RDC, of course, and other financing in Africa. So I would, I would very uh, modestly be a little blunt, but warn you on uh, Chinese financing. OK, thank you very much indeed. And the, the remark which was made on China uh, now exporting, I mean, importing money out of Africa, I must confess I didn't know that. Uh, uh, of course, it means that uh, they are repayments on the one hand and new money on the other hand, but the algebraic uh, computation would give a negative flow coming from Africa to, to China. I didn't know that. Uh, it has to be checked because it's, it's a little bit uh, uh, surprising. But thank you very much. So now we have to respond to all the questions which were asked to the speakers. So uh, could you raise your hands? Uh, you, you, a lot of questions on trade. John, you respond? And of yeah. course you have, uh, I, I was going to say a few words on the, the uh, debt issues. And uh, uh, first of all, that debt issues are high, but of course, the issue of how much is too much depends on how much does debt cost. And then in this context, it's, I think it's very, it, it's critical whether the central banks are successful in reducing inflation, because if so, it will reduce long-term interest rates. As I put it in the U.S. context, for the first time uh, in my memory, in my lifetime, individuals, households, have, have structured their own financial affairs with the assumption of sustained low inflation and low interest rates. And it, that's why I think it'll be very in interesting. I, I assume that there, in fact, is rather broad public support for getting inflation back down again and in interest rates. If that's the case, then the, the challenge with regard to debt levels will be, uh, will be muted relative to what they, what they would be otherwise. And with regard to sovereign debt, uh, the, uh, of course, pre-1990, 
before the global financial crisis, the Paris Club pr provided a working, uh, a working process for, re for restructuring uh, sovereign debt, and that obviously, if there is a working system, a smoothly working system, that encourages, uh, that makes it easier for countries to borrow. Uh, the system is broken right now for reasons that we all understand, uh, and the G20 established something called the Common Framework for, for Debt Treatments that has not been anywhere near as successful as, as anticipated. What is happening now, it's uh, low profile. The, under the IMF and World Bank have jointly established something called the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable that has brought together in a confidential way, uh, re not completely confidential, there's a public report of, the, of their discussions, both lenders, borrowers, both private and public. And hopefully there's enough of pressure on all sides to make some uh, arrangements that will at least uh, make this uh, process much more, uh, much easier. Just two, one other thing. When we talk about why hasn't more money gone into things like climate change, public goods, uh, the, we're working on this at the Bretton Woods Committee, and think of it in terms of two gaps, a public sector gap and a private sector gap. What is specifically holding back uh, debt flows? For the private sector, there's a lack of price discovery mechanisms for things like lending for uh, uh, climate-related uh, projects. There's a lack at present of adequate instruments by which you could express that uh, investment, and a lack of enforcement mechanisms, reliable enforcement mechanisms, that mean if you, in, if a private, if you invest in a project, how do you know it's really going to produce the results that uh, were expected? There was a session on this earlier today that, mm -hmm. was, uh, that was very interesting, I thought. For the public sector, what are the problems? There's a lack of any governance, clear governance structure and financing. It's each institution doing its own thing. There's lack of governance on implementation in for these kinds of projects. There's, there's no standardization and similarly, there's no independent ex post assessment, simil similarly for the private sector, that you know that what you, uh, you can count on what you did, what you lent actually had the, uh, uh, had the effect that was claimed. And it seems to us that until those specific gaps are filled, we're not going to have a, any substantial uh, increase in flows. These are preconditions for, uh, for success. There you mentioned the absence of coordination between the bilateral donors, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah because the multilateral institutions are, are functioning more or less. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Mazoud is the floor. I just want to say one thing about uh, the uh, private investment that you, you asked, uh, and Jean-Michel gave part of the answer uh, to that. I would just say two th you know, one thing that we have to be clear, for, uh, clear about is to be more realistic about where we expect private flows to go. So we're more likely to get private flows into emerging markets and better middle-income countries than we are in fragile states. So it, to me, it makes less sense to put a lot of official money grants to try and subsidize private sector to attract them to fragile states, because you use a lot of grants to get limited amount of private money. Whereas if you do in middle income countries, you can actually get more. So I think one is just to be a bit more open, clear eyed about that. And the other thing is the instruments that they use. So for example, you know, you just look at the World Bank, if they use guarantees, they mobilize four times as much private money with guarantees than they do with the loan. But the internal incentives for doing guarantees is that it doesn't help the staff to do a guarantee. So they like to do loans rather than guarantees. Now here's something you can change that would have an impact. So I think that's just one on private sector. The second thing I wanted to respond to was on debt, just to pick up one point. One is that there are a lot of countries that the IMF has been saying for four years are at high risk of debt distress. But there are very few countries that actually default. If you look at the number of countries that have defaulted, 
And that's not because they're not under pressure. It's because the cost of defaulting in the system we have to fix defaults today is really high for a finance minister. So we did some work looking at what happens to their spending. And what happens is that they keep paying their debt service, which is rising, sometimes 50%, 70% of their revenues. But they cut back on education, they cut back on health, and they cut back on future investment. So in effect, they're defaulting on the next generation rather than to their external creditors because the cost of doing that is very high. And, and linked to that, I would just say they're the system will not improve for a year or 18 months. Despite the efforts of this sovereign debt roundtable, it's slow, it's messy, it be small incremental improvement. I personally don't think that 18 months from now we'll have a radically better system. And therefore the question really to me is, in this situation, how do you help the countries that are under the greatest financial liquidity pressures today rather than hoping that somehow the system is going to get fixed and they're going to have some grand design. You know, the World Bank is very keen, actually, on talking about, let's have another HIPIC. And, uh, you know, first of all, HIPIC doesn't make sense for the current structure of creditors. And secondly, there's no political basis on which the Chinese and the Paris Club creditors will come together in a HIPIC-like format now. And therefore, we should be focusing our energies on how, what helps the countries the most rather than on some grand design which is unlikely to come about with the politics being what they are. So, Thank you very much indeed, Masoud. As a former president of Paris Club, I will say a word, but after we have heard all the response, all the responses. So uh, do we have other speakers that would, would? Yeah, please, please, of course, Bertrand. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Uh, I wanted to react to Jan's uh, proposition. I, I think what, what strikes me today is that on the one hand, we continue to say that there is an emergency. Uh, and, uh, but we don't act as if it was a real emergency. We talk about this being urgent. We talk about we need to change things. And the reality is that it's more of the same. So instead of putting one billion, you put two billion. And the two billion don't move anyway. Uh, and, and so I think we. I mean, we've addressed all the issues, all the gaps, et cetera, and again, no need to come back on that. But I think to face this sense of emergency, we should really work on two things, uh, learning to be a little bit more generous. Uh, and I think uh, generosity is not necessarily a word that match well with, uh, well with finance, but I think, uh, as you say, we, we need, I mean, this, this, I think this was the words of President Macron in Paris. What he means with that, not sure, but he said we need a shock of concessional finance. We need, we all, grant money. I mean, we don't have, I mean, we are discussing, I mean, you, you can ask the World Bank to lend more, but this will add to the debt thing. So it, it's a vicious circle. So I think we need to be generous in a way or another. We have been capable in a number of countries to subsidize gasoline during the rise of prices, I mean, 50 billion in France. I mean, we could have used this money in a different manner. I mean, it's a, of course, it raised political questions, et cetera. So generosity and, and, and our genuine interest is to move in that direction. I think this is, this is important. And the second thing, coming back to Jan's point, I think we have to be a little bit more innovative in the way we apprehend things. I think we will die of doing more of the same forever. In, uh, the, in the regulatory framework itself, course. yeah. Of course, no, no, but there are a number of issues coming back to Senegal. I mean, depending on whether you're OECD country or non-OECD country, with the same rating, the cost of capital for an investment is double. With the same uh, rating, and, and there are, I mean, the long list of things is like this. And, and we know that, and we know it's urgent. We explain, I mean, I don't want to enter into the discussion on how to finance uh, gas in Senegal. I mean, this is a very interesting topic. But you, you have all these issues everywhere, and we circle around. And, and so I, I, I strongly support this type of approach. We need to, I'm not sure this is the right one, but at least to, to address this, we have a global issue which needs to be addressed locally, and we need to find the instruments which connect the local and the global to go there. And we are incapable of doing that. OK, so if we want to be a little bit practical, could we say that, first of all, we need China on board, goes without saying because it's a, an anomaly which is very, very great. And we should exert maximum pressure on Chinese friends for them to, to join the international community in a domain where it is in their own interest, because it's not their interest 
to be uh, free in freelance in this domain, no? Yes, I, I agree with you. Of course, we need to have as many people on board as possible, including obviously China. But, but China, it, China is the first creditor, so yeah, 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 it, it, uh, it's come, come aberrant. For, the other should not do anything because uh, they would work for. Uh, no, I think it's a, it's a matter of understanding exactly how the the problem. I, I discussed with Chinese friends; they have a difficulty to understand exactly what is at stake because they have not their own procedure to reschedule, and they prefer to deliver new money and get uh, the, the payment, so, but, but yeah. anyway, so. Uh, let me just, because, yeah. uh, uh, and, uh, yeah. of course we need to have China, but it's not, it shouldn't be an excuse for the EU or the US not to do anything. I mean, we have said at the G7. Uh, uh, who it, says that they do nothing? I'm the EU. No, I mean, we, we do things, but we could do way more. I mean, we have said at the G7 in Germany last year in El Mao that the, the G7 will commit $600 billion uh, to emerging and developing economies. I remember I was with President Macron in Africa, and one of the guys, there were some people from the civil society, he said, President Macron, this is great, where is the money? Yeah. It's a fair question. Of it's a course, fair question. of course. But yeah. if, if you take the case of it's France, it's Fra 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 France is broke, so it's not a very good example. Uh, no, no fr frankly speaking, do we, we have magnificent promises, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated to, to, to get the money out of the budget. Uh, but uh, yeah, please, sir. I guess uh, many people mentioned the, the, the debt uh, China to developing countries. I guess um, some factor we should keep in mind. Yes, China is one of the largest official um, uh, debt uh, countries. But if you look at the whole uh, debt uh, situation, actually private credit occupy most debt owned by developing countries. Having said that, I'm not going to uh, defend uh, what Chinese government you know. From what I heard from some Chinese officials, what they worry about is if uh, Chinese government uh, involve some debt restriction, they worry about the money they give out <laughs> the debt country will pay back to private credit. That's something they a little bit of concern. So no, no, as, as someone say, we should, uh, like uh, John say, get it together yeah. to have uh, some comprehensive uh, the, the debt it's, restriction. It, it is the, the right concept. You're absolutely right. The right concept is that there is a balance of efforts made by all creditors on the one hand, and it should be emulated by the same balance of credit on the other hand. And the, the idea was always, we understand that it's very difficult for, uh, for the private sector, but then the private sector can compensate with new money. I mean, th th there was always a balance. If it is not balanced, you're absolutely right. There is no case. Nobody uh, will be uh, happy, and neither the private nor the public uh, uh, in any of the countries concerned. So we have to re reconstruct something which would work. The, pri the, the public uh, sector, in my opinion, is up and running, but one country is not participant. The private sector, that's another story. And the work that you're doing in the Bretton Woods, uh, and, and uh, the, I would say, the uh, institution concerns that you mentioned is very, very important, of course, uh, John. Huh? What, what, I'll say just okay. one word. The, um, the, the idea of the sovereign debt work, uh, round table is exactly get everybody around the table. The situation is everybody's going to have to do something. I think the trigger is going to be the, the debtor countries, and as Masood has pointed out, who have been basically a, uh, uh, starving themselves in a way. Uh, or on a, on a severe diet to avoid re trying to restructure because the system is so broken, I think they, they have to put pressure on the, on the uh, lending countries and saying, enough is enough, you guys have got to get together. Hopefully that round table will be a context, a confidential context in which they can say we, we all have to participate. I, I hope it's faster than Masood's uh, timetable, but. Jean-Claude, very quickly, I, I, I am very skeptical that China will join uh, the Paris Club for a simple reason. 
they, they have their own two-thirds, more than 60% actually, of country-to-country -country debt. And they have very strong convenience, I mean, very strong bilateral agreements. Why would they mutualize the risk? You because know? it was the case of all the other creditors. At the very beginning, there was no such agreement. But now it's And then late. progressively, all public creditors discovered that if they wanted to get out of the difficulties and help the countries concerned, they had to discuss together to be sure that everybody would make the same efforts, whatever the covenant uh, and so forth. But we, 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 again, it's, it's easy to speak of uh, a government which is not there. Very easy. But I, I had exactly the same problem in my time with some emerging economies that were creditor of, and, and we had arrangement. We could solve the problem. It is, it is solvable. Now, now an, another problem, another problem which is solvable, uh, Mazoud, is to change the culture inside the MDBs and the World Bank. But yes, in principle. Because if a, a, a significant part of the risk can be taken by the public institutions, then we are leveraging the private sector. Please, madam. Yes, the country you're talking about, I mean, I'm <laughs> part of one of them. So actually, I think sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a dialogue that we, and we don't understand ourselves. First of all, there is no ideology involved in the financing of our economy. Wherever the money can come from, we're looking for it. So it that it has to be very clear. And Europeans should not see it as African being pro-Chinese. We could be pro whoever as long as the money comes. So, so that yeah. it has to be very clear, clear enough. because clear. It's, take, it's taking a political sometime turn into it. Um, what we are looking forward, and Masoud, thank you for saying that we are the best payers when it comes to our debt. We, we, we just pay to the last penny. So that needs to be said. It's not like gifts that you know, are just delivered. And we starve ourselves sometimes to do so because we know the cost. If you don't do that, you don't, re you don't pay your civil servant, and you're out as a government because you have the streets that will take you out. So that we do pay. But what we are looking forward to is money sitting on the market, and we do have great plan of, of developing our industry, for instance. In Senegal, we, we don't even manufacture needles. We import them. Um, and that's where the support is expected on a win-win situation, because I, I do believe it's going to be business-to-business uh, -business development. So I do think that there is a money for that. Everybody can make money on it, so why it's not happening? So that's my, that's my very question. And then you go back to some type of ideology, because I'm like, is there a willingness collectively to support those countries to get out of their current situation? You ended up doubting it. Because they, I mean, I don't know, because the money is there. So if we can, if we can sit down and have really a, a reasonable discussion, then we can make it together. Because I you, do think Europe needs that. You were speaking I, I of, of public money or private money for, for the needles? Well, you will always have the public supporting the business to business contract. I mean, by creating the, 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 the right environment, uh, making sure that uh, justice, uh, you know, come along, uh, corruption is uh, contained, uh, you know, contained, uh, and, and things like that. So that's, that's why I, I think we don't understand each other most of the time, because every time I have this kind of discussion with bankers, um, it, it, they, they have hard time understanding where we are coming from. Um, and why I raise the, the China issue um, if you look into the period, the 15 years of collaboration, some countries with China, they have never been able to raise money to develop the minimum of their infrastructure. That's why when China came in, that you saw the boom. And that's the truth. That's what we have seen. That, that's the real truth. So in between, we had a 500 years relationship with Europe. It didn't happen. And then you have a 20 or 15 years with China, it does. So uh, see the, where the logic is. So that, that's, that, that's, that's really, I mean, I'm talking to you very bluntly. Yeah, because yeah, that's no, what we, how we discuss we it to, among ourselves. You have the, this extent so, yeah. of views, so, of so, course. So please look into it. I'm saying that because, China, because Senegal is going to be a caste country. We have one of the huge, we think, 
reserved of gas. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the question is going to be right there. Mm -hmm. So but we, they will be necessary to have a, a change in the, in the thinking uh, coming from the banking sector um, in Europe, precisely. Otherwise, we will do business with whoever. Yeah. Because we need that, that but, business to happen. But Mrs. Minister, we were uh, yeah. not uh, saying that China was giving uh, too much money to the country's concern. We were, <laughs> on the contrary, uh, realizing perhaps that the flow is in the other direction, which is not necessarily the case for your own idea and your own investment. But clearly, the problem was to have all the countries of the world in order to try to solve the problems, the public credit. I'm, I'm only speaking of public credit. The private credit are in the hands of this uh, concept that you are trying to uh, crystallize. But we have specialists of ODA here. Uh, and I would like very much to hear Mazoud and Jean-Michel, perhaps. How would you comment on uh, what said the Minister of Senegal? W would you say that? Uh, if we change the culture of the MDBs, then we will find the money, including by leveraging the private money for doing what uh, the minister is asking for? Well, uh, no, I think that, that will certainly help. But I would say there's a bigger problem, which is, uh, if you look at our ODA, I think somebody made the point earlier that uh, we have 200 billion, roughly, give or take, of ODA, right? It's gone up in the last four years. But all the increase is accounted for by the extra money that we spend on refugees in our own countries here. So the largest recipient of Swedish order today is Sweden. The largest recipient of UK order is the UK. <laughs> so, and that doesn't help. Secondly, it's the money we're putting into Ukraine. And so if you look at order to Africa, it has actually gone down. So, it's, so I would say there's a general point. And secondly, I would also say now we want to use the same order for doing climate finance in middle-income countries. So we're saying we need to use this ODA to incentivize the middle-income countries, Indonesia, to borrow for coal commissioning, decommissioning of coal. They need cheaper money, so let's use ODA. And they're going to IDA, which is the only window that is really focused on poor countries, low-income countries, along with the African Bank. And they're saying, can you find ways to reallocate? But half of our ODA actually goes to middle-income countries. So why are we not asking, how about reallocating the money we already give to middle-income countries for less uh, important things than climate change? So I think there is that issue. And the final thing I would just say is, you know, all of this conversation falls in, is one basic issue in my mind, which is we need to have straightforward and frank conversations about what we can do and what we can't do and what is feasible and what is not feasible. It would be a lot better if we were able to give the money for refugees and cut back on ODA and not pretend that it was ODA. It's better to say to countries, look, we can't do as much ODA as we thought because we have to take care of refugees who have come into our country. But it's another to say, look at our ODA numbers that have gone up. Yeah. And you have to dig and find that actually it's not real. So I, I do feel that part of the problem we have now is this trust issue, which comes from not having a frank uh, and clear dialogue. Very clear. Jean-Michel. Yes, very quickly. Uh, I think we are experiencing uh, quite a negative time for financing uh, Africa and ex external imbalances. Uh, the, uh, we have talked about ODA, and it's correct to say that in the past three years, ODA in <coughs> absolute volumes has declined. Uh, remittances, remittances have declined because of the overall macroeconomic situation in Europe, in Canada, in the US, etc. Uh, China has reduced, has, re has reduced massively its lending for the reasons that we have already mentioned. Uh, and on top of it, uh, Africa has now experienced also increased uh, balance of payment problems, or, I mean, commercial deficits problems. Of all the continent has increased its uh, commercial deficit. So it's, it's, it's a complicated period. And there's a need for uh, a, a big change, 
if one wants to, to see that changing. Of course, this is a broad assessment about the continent. Country by country, it's different. Not all countries are in the same situation. And obviously, the ones that are in the most difficult situations are the ones which are owing most money to China. I mean, it's the big oil and mineral producers, because this is there that the Chinese money concentrated. Actually, uh, uh, Chinese money is not, uh, is not at all distributed even across uh, Africa, but massively concentrated in, on uh, around five, six, six countries uh, uh, okay. that have specificity. So we have to address that. And as far as the MDB, but also the bilateral um, uh, ODA is concerned, we have a major uh, issue to solve on both sides, which is the issue of conditionality. This is the one which has been uh, the most contentious. Uh, how is it run? What is it uh, under conditionality, macro, micro, etc.? This is the poison in, in the uh, ODA uh, pill, which is preventing money to flow faster uh, and to reach uh, the basic needs of the, of the countries. And, the, the, and everybody has, has, a, has, a, has a problem there, but the MDDs particularly. OK, fine. The prime minister as uh, the floor, <laughs> please. Yeah. Oh, you, will, you will have the floor immediately after, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. First, I, I think it's, uh, it was important that Aminata uh, <coughs> creates a bit of emotion on the situation of uh, Africa and other emerging markets. But I concur with Jean-Michel. I mean, Africa is in a credit crunch is an equity crunch, which, which is, in a sense, uh, worse than what uh, happened in 2009, for instance. So it's a real, uh, real crisis. With a sort of pandemic situation, where when you have a default of, of a country, it has an effect on countries absolutely in, in, in a Deep, deeply different uh, situation. So the fact that Ghana is in default has <clears throat> a paradoxical immediate impact on the Ivory Coast, for instance, mm. uh, and so on and so forth, mm. even if the situations are very, very different. But to be constructive, uh, maybe one or two comments. To attract the private sector, we can easily put uh, <clears throat> a few uh, tools uh, on the table. We know how to insure the risk. We know how to, uh, how to buy and sell the risks. I mean, it's not technically that difficult. Mm. Uh, in the World Bank Group, Bertrand, MIGA can be it's, it's quite an easy decision, uh, a, a, a sort of m more efficient tool, an essential tool. We know how to develop the guarantee funds. I mean, it's not rocket science. We have a lot of experience. So I think that uh, treating, uh, addressing the risks professionally is really quite simple. Second, uh, Bertrand said something very real. Apart from the funding uh, of climate change or social goals in development, I mean, we, we have a problem of being able to absorb what has been collected in terms of funds. And Bertrand is right when he says it's very difficult for, the, for the, the emerging countries and the developing countries to be able easily, professionally, to absorb. Take the forestry, for instance. Forestry, you can find business models to invest there, to get the carbon credits, and to have a very positive impact on the planet. OK. But we have not the tax environment. We have not the concession legal 
system efficient in, in, in every uh, country. If you take the Bassin du Congo, if you take the Congo River system, you have an immense potential and a very, very little number of projects. So even when we have, and if we were able to attract more mm -hmm. private uh, finance with the proper risk and insurance environment, we have to uh, support the absorption of those funds. Yeah, but is it the uh, domestic legislation yeah. that you put into question? Or I mean, that? the countries are very in, in unequal positions. I mean, you could say that uh, Gabon is a bit adva more advanced, or Ivory Coast, or but the, uh, South Africa. But we, c we can improve that mm -hmm. quite easily. Look at what is done in terms of extractive industries contracts. I mean, support by the World Bank, by the African Development Bank, in order to optimize or normalize that. We can do that. Look at the uh, facility to be financed in, 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 uh, for, for legal professionalism, uh, the, the, the grants by the African Development Bank. We have made huge progress in terms of due diligence and execution and contractual uh, systems uh, for the governments through grants. I mean, we can easily technically support, and it's cheap, uh, ways for the environment, the business environment to progress. Because as of today, it's maybe the, 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 the worst uh, sort of obstacle when Bertrand says blended finance is very difficult to implement and, and, and make efficient, I mean, it's a daily experience for the private sector mm. to have no efficient and professional interface. But it's, it's cheap and simple. And look at the privatization. It was a huge transfer of asset ownership. Huge, historical in Africa in the late uh, 90s. It has been supported by, for instance, the World Bank Group in terms of uh, professional support, uh, grants and financing for the processes to be efficient. So it's cheap to improve the systems, but the processes are quite important. I mean, the, the, the actual real processes. And on that, we can make uh, fast progress. Clear enough. Thank, Thank you. you very much, because you introduce an element of uh, dynamism in the capacity to get out of the, of the difficulty. Thank you very much, John. Please, you have the floor. It might be the last question, and then we will have a wrap-up with the speakers. Please, sir. Thank you. So, Nicolas Pio, I'm, I'm an investor in private equity, and I've been an investor in energy for 20, 23 years, basically. I, I will expand on Madame Chouy, Prime Minister's uh, question. And just maybe a quick addition to Mr. Mayor's point on Montenegro, because I think it's actually quite important. Not only is it expensive, but what we, what we need to understand is are the, the provisions in the loan agreement granted by the Chinese. It prevents Montenegro to go to another, uh, another um, uh, debt provider, typically Europe, because they are forbidden to actually reimburse that loan because in this case, if they default, there is a provision by which the Chinese can actually grab a piece of land of Montenegro. And it, in that matter, it is the port of, I don't remember if it's Qatar or Brasilia. But I think we need to really understand, for having worked with CIC for quite some time, they know their contracts upside down and there is no clause that is made at random. And so I think the example you're mentioning is super important because it was true of the Gaboron uh, coal plant in, in Botswana. It was true of a number of infrastructures in the world. And I think we need to understand that the, the, this does not come cheap. It may seem cheap on the pricing issue, but it certainly does not come cheap with the structures that you've mentioned. But the point that I, I would like to expand on, and, and the question, which is maybe a bit provocative, is that I'm wondering in the end if, if our financial system is not fairly obsolete. Because I think the point that Madam Prime Minister is raising is, is capital allocation. You were talking about the, the, the US stock market, which is actually holding pretty well today. Well, the reality is 
out of the 3.4 trillion that were added by the MSCI in 2023, 4 trillion comes from, from the Magnificent Seven, so the Amazons, the, the Microsofts, the NVIDIAs, etc. which means that all the rest is actually, has actually destroyed value on the stock market. So seven stocks added 4 trillion for a stock market that added 3.4 trillion. And I see that in, in, in my own world, and I think it goes back to my prime minister issue. Today, it's very easy to raise 200 million on a pre-seed round on AI. 200 million for a pre-product, pre-revenue, pre-idea. And it's very hard to finance projects in, in, in developing countries. For one reason, is because the risk aversion, and I fully agree with Mr. Ahmed, it's not only the public sector. It's the private sector. And the private sector far prefers adding another round of financing of uh, chat GPT or open AI or whatever, rather than <laughs> investing in the real stuff that should, we should be investing in because externalities are not priced in in our, in our financial system. Very good remark, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, to think that there is no risk associated with investing massively in startups is also a fantasy. So we, we are, but okay, the, the, the system has to be fixed in many, many respects, that's clear. So it was a very uh, stimulating and interesting uh, exchange of views. Uh, the government of China was not there, so uh, oh, we... <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. But thank you very much for, for all your remarks. It was very, very well done. So. Uh, can I ask the speakers whether they have a last remark? I think we, we had positives and negatives, not only negatives in the exchange of views. And we, we know that we can perhaps, uh, and particularly, I have to say, in the MDB's institution and the, the I would say, public uh, ODA uh, framework, uh, take, taking more risk and uh, leveraging much more uh, private capital. That, that, that is certainly one positive in, in the, at least coming out of our discussion. But uh, uh, the world remains extremely demanding, that's clear. So I go in the reverse uh, order. Jean Claude. Well, thank you. Jean Please. No, I hope that the last, rates last will go down because it's absolutely uh, obscene to have rates of 10% for Ivory Coast or for Senegal right now. It's obscene. It's impossible. We cannot advise a government to raise euro bonds with 10% interest rates. It's, and we are exporting from the developed countries. Uh, our diseases, COVID, inflation, high interest rates. Well, higher interest rates. <laughs> but but, but these higher interest rates will permit us to get back to price stability, which is good for everybody. So uh, I mentioned that en passant. <laughs> André. I think all the investors are focusing on so-called ESG uh, performance of companies. I think they should rather look at what they do for developing countries and what they do for Africa, and what to do meaningful things rather than worry about ESG. Yeah, you don't like ESG. Really? <laughs> My neighbors are very shocked. Uh, Akiri. Well, I'm not an expert in uh, development finance, but just one <coughs> word about Paris Club. Don't forget, there was a um, uh, process called London Club as well, yep. along with uh, Paris Club. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, as far as private debt uh, rescheduling, concerned. Uh, Bill Rowe is always uh, chairman of uh, London Club, and uh, negotiation usually took place in New York, but uh, it's labeled London Club anyway. True. And, <laughs> and uh, along with uh, uh, the public debt uh, rescheduling under the auspices of uh, Paris Club, uh, Jean-Claude was uh, chairman for a long time ago, uh, three decades ago, I think. Um, London Club approach happened and uh, usually uh, you know at the winks and arm twisting by center banks of uh, uh, the same countries and uh, have them uh, go along with Paris Club uh, offshore debt rescheduling. 
that's, that's what happened, actually, uh, many years ago. So uh, the Chinese concern about the you know, possibility that the public uh, you know, money bailed out, going to private sector, that didn't happen that way because of the London Club approach. Thank you. It, it was easier at the time because we had banks right. and not, right. Uh, right. I would say, bonds. Yeah. I'll just say one thing in, in uh, defense of uh, the, if you look at the contracts, we actually at CGD, we did a detailed study of looking at the contracts of, uh, that were done for individual loans that were made by Chinese banks. It's true that some of them actually had exactly the kinds of constraints. But I think you see now a learning process over time. So I do feel that the more recent loans that were being made were more aligned with sort of what are the international norms. Because it's a learning process that I think all creditors went through. And, and the other thing I would say, you know, Larry Summers is the chair of uh, CGD. And he made uh, one comment when uh, he said, you know, when we go talk to a, a finance minister from Africa, the Chinese offer him expensive uh, financing, and we offer him a lecture. And at the end of the day, no matter how wise our lecture, it doesn't compete with the financing. So I think we just have to bear in mind as to what is the alternative offer that you're putting on the table. Thank you very much indeed. Bertrand. Thank you. Uh, I will just uh, refer to, to the summit I mentioned, which happened in Paris in, in June. We can discuss whether it was a success or not, but I think the intuition was right. What we need is to find the terms of a new global financing pact, not just a new Bretton Woods, but a new way to address these issues. And I remember I asked uh, Thomas Buber, who is the CEO of AXA, to, to come on stage. And uh, what, what he said struck me. He said, what we need to bring in the conversation is the world together. Just simply together. Because everybody is in his lane. Everybody is saying, I'm, I'm right. I know what I want to do. I know what I need, etc." But we don't talk to each other. We, we don't really work together. I mean, we see that at every level. Mm -hmm. And so I think this, this new pact, which I expect, it might take a number of years, will not be decided by one country, one institution, etc. And it's difficult because, as we've discussed, I mean, there are a lot of centrifugal forces that basically break the together approach. But for me, this is critical. We, we, we need to find ways to work together. Thank you. Yeah. So I basically agree with, uh, uh, with uh, this. Is, it shows that development finance is uh, at, at the core of uh, today's problems. And uh, I agree with Masoud that there is a short-term urgency, but I hope that we won't stop at the short term, because we are going to have a succession of short-term urgencies uh, in, in the future, as we did in the recent past as well. I would also agree that all well, this is a, co it's a coordination problem, uh, doing it together indeed. And it's not only a public problem. I think the, the, the Paris Club was, was, was extraordinarily successful for the public side, but it took years to, to join forces with the private sector, and I hope that the round table will be able to actually associate all this, uh, and that, will be, that it will be more than a crisis management mechanism, that it can be actually a framework for future debt contracts as well. And uh, what worries me is that we are, we, are, we are still thinking in terms of crisis management while there is a major pathology of the financial system that needs to be addressed. One word on risk aversion. <clears throat> I think it's built in. And I, I, was, I was struck when I was at AFD that we were spending so much time trying to actually decrease the risk of our investments, while development finance is about risk taking. And there is no alternative because you can't go to your parliament with taxpayers' money and, uh, oh, this is what we did with your money and we took risks. No, we, you have to go to them. We make sure that what we finance is riskless. Because if not, you won't get any money for future ODA. So it, it's a big contradiction there. One, there, are, there are ways to think about it, uh, to create a set-aside fund to take risks, for example. And it's openly mentioned as that. But it, it, it's, it's something that requires innovation and discussion. One final word on efficiency. And I think I, 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 it may be provocative. But I think the way we define efficiency, including now, doesn't take into account all the discussions about externality climate change, environment, and so on. I'm not sure that trade is efficient in many cases where transport costs are undervalued. 
and that the, the, the price of transport doesn't reflect the social cost, for example. So I will be careful about mentioning efficiency without redefining what we mean by it, because we are in a situation in which we need to understand better when things are efficient, not only from sheer economic current perspective, but including all the climate externalities. Externalities, the, yeah, you are criticizing the price system in which the market economy functions, of course. John. I guess I get the, the penultimate word, the final word will be to the chairman, but let me try to uh, end on a, on a more upbeat note. Uh, the, the consensus is that global growth is going to be sustained. And uh, a year and a half ago, the consensus was we were headed for a recession. And it looks like we've avoided a recession. We are bringing inflation down. And a, not that long ago, there was concern that this process was also going to involve a financial crisis when the uh, Credit Suisse and uh, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, failed. And it looks like that's not happening. So if that's the case, and we can look forward to 2024 and beyond, sustained growth back to low inflation and greater, in, and greater confidence in the stability of the financial sector despite risks, uh, that's not a, not a bad outcome. And that's probably a positive, a positive environment for starting to think constructively about addressing these kind of big problems. Thank you very much indeed, John. So uh, I conclude, uh, first of all, in thanking uh, all the speakers because they stick to what had been the rule, concentrate on a few issues. I know that we had no speaker and no discussion on the next financial crisis which is looming. On the contrary, we could see that we could cope with this uh, start of uh, difficulty in Credit Suisse and in the US uh, Regional Bank. I don't exclude, frankly speaking, that we could have big problems in the non-bank financial intermediation and uh, anything can still happen, particularly if uh, interest rates remain at a high level, obviously, and uh, it is exactly what uh, the central banks are telling us, huh? longer, uh, for longer, enfin, high for longer, or higher for longer, uh, even if, in my opinion, they succeeded extremely well in trying to regain control, but, uh, but uh, on the non-bank, which is not, uh, I would say, under the prudentials of the banks, uh, anything can still happen. I am struck and very impressed by the fact that we discussed development, development aid, uh, financing with private uh, funds uh, the development. I have to thank the minister uh, because uh, Madame, you draw our attention on that, and it, it, it had a, an echo which was uh, overwhelming. I mean, we all discussed that. <clears throat> Thank you also for uh, all the questionnaires. So I, I think that if, if I had to conclude with a few words, I would say we are relatively confident at this stage, despite the abominable tensions that we have to cope with, geostrategic tensions, we know that a lot of uh, surprises, unfortunate surprises, can come, and that we have to be prepared for everything. Uh, and we prove that, at least in the banking sector, with what I just mentioned, because the reaction of the authorities was extraordinarily rapid, both in the US and in uh, Europe, in Switzerland. Uh, and, and rapidity of reaction is absolutely of the essence if we have new teasing coming from here and there. And, but, uh, but again, I take the sentiment that uh, we should guard ourselves of being too confident or too optimistic, if I may. That being said, thank you so much for all what uh, you have uh, done in participating actively in this uh, uh, workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you.